last of our keynote speakers this morning is Susie Moser, a member of the Hadley Climate Change Committee and relatively new to Hadley. She comes to us as a nationally and internationally recognized expert in climate change adaptation and communication. After prior employment at Harvard, the University of Concerned Scientists, Stanford, and other institutions, she is now an affiliated faculty of the Department of Landscape, Architecture, and Regional Planning, and otherwise works as an independent researcher and consultant, helping local communities, states, federal agencies, nonprofits, and other organizations to prepare for the impacts of climate change. Susie has contributed to various IPCCs, national and regional climate assessments. Thank you, Susie. amazing to shift from getting you all here to actually saying something. <laughs> all right. So what I would like to do is um, extend what we've heard so far in two ways. Um, you just heard from Ted, who focused very much on how to address the climate change problem, what I call from the front end, right? To prevent it, to minimize it, to reduce the, uh, the emissions that cause the problem. But if we did that 100% tomorrow, we would still see more warming. Why? Because the warming we've seen so far is the result of the emissions we made 30 years ago. It takes that long, it stays in the atmosphere that long. So no matter what we do, even if we do everything, and we must do everything on the front end of the problem, we're still going to see impact, all right? So that's one way. The other piece I want to do is to extend Julie's um, taking it from the global to the local. You heard a lot about it's getting wetter, hotter. Well, what does that mean? I want to take that to Hadley, to the things we all care about. This is what makes up a lot of our community, at least the natural environment, of course, all the businesses that depend on that, right? What does it mean to have a hotter future? You see a little graphic here that comes from a Massachusetts website that looks at the number of really hot days um, in the future. So it's not just the increases in average, as she said, it's also these very hot summer days. We all have had a taste of that already. Well, we're seeing that number going up, and this is that Imagine that that's the, the dog owner, <laughs> right? The average. May very well be that, you know, from year to year that varies a lot more. But what, why is that important? Well, we're in the senior center. <laughs> All I want to say is this is a great investment. This will be the cooling center of Hadley in the future, not just for the very young, for the, for the elderly, for, but for the very young, for those with pre existing medical conditions. Those are the ones who are most vulnerable to the extreme temperature increases that we're going to see. But what about the people who work outside, our farmers? <coughs> what about their animals, right? They're going to have to live with that heat. So we have to find an answer for them. And I will not forget the pets. I have some of those, um, and you know they are at risk too from high temperatures. What about the wetter future? Increasing precip rainfall, in particular, these extreme events. Um, so we're already seeing what that means. Route 9. This is 150,000 people drive on this road every single day to go to all the businesses. In those conditions, not so much. That affects all of us, right? The river flooding, the levee is one issue. It's not a very big um, levee. I just want to say, you know, the fact that it's so flat here, that's not because someone bulldozed that. <laughs> the river did that. It is flat here because the river flooded here before. It has happened before, it will happen again. That little levee is not going to do a heck of a lot of good for us. But it's street flooding, right? It is coming up, not even over the levee. It's not being able to drain into the river. So how are we going to affect that? It affects our streets, traffic ways, homes, businesses, and I will point out particularly those people who don't have a lot of income. For them, this is going to be the hardest, right? And this is the dog part, the you know running around around the, the averages, the greater variability, more extremes, seasonal shifts. You see examples. So despite it getting wetter, we still will get droughts. We already have them. 
with the seasonal shifts occurring earlier in the winter to spring, right? We've seen that with things already starting to bloom and then you get a frost. So we're making actually our crops a lot more vulnerable. Um, you see the impacts uh, on, on crops when we don't get enough water. One of the positive things we might say is that the increased carbon in the atmosphere actually makes our forests grow stronger, bigger. So we've seen that, it's a, um, one of the benefits of it. And because of the uh, warmer temperatures, in particular during the winter, we get a lot more of pests. And I just put one example here, agricultural pests, we all have the mosquitoes, Outside, you see, you know, a display on, on how we deal with the increased number of it, it, mosquitoes, um, wind storms. We all have those problems already, right? So those are all the kinds of extremes and what they mean to us uh, in in reality. I want to go a little bit further on the human health side. So hotter, wetter, more allergies. What does that mean? Well. The heat-related ones I already mentioned, that's you know, cardiovascular disease, people who are already um, vulnerable to those, more heat will not help them at all. Um, I'll go around in the clockwise fashion. Um, one of the things that is so often not considered, yes, more storms, more floods, all of those things actually mean more likely deaths or injuries and mental health impacts. People don't talk about that, and it is already a, a big and growing issue. Um, asthma, cardiovascular disease, particular children, um, particular low-income people, people with already a great burden on them, right? We're seeing outside, you saw the, the little display there um, by Mass Ken about the pipeline. More toxins, more fumes, all will increase the problem with asthma. More heat, more sunlight, you get more asthma, ozone production asthma. An increase in the kind of um, bugs that uh, carry diseases, Lyme disease is already a big issue, it will only spread. And I could just go on here, respiratory diseases. Um, if you have more, more rainfall, more flooding, um, you get more runoff, more toxins going into our waterways, a problem for our uh, water quality issues, right? Hunger is very likely to increase if we have decreases in food production, um, people who will spend more time, more money on keeping their homes cool might have less uh, money for food or vice versa. Um, and then ultimately there will be displacement of people in the most unlivable areas. And that might not be Hadley, but they might come to Hadley, <laughs> right? People who in coastal areas will lose their homes, or people in uh, drought-prone areas in the West will find ways to, to live in a, in a um, livable, beautiful place. This is one of them. So compared to the rest of the nation, this is one of the areas that is relatively safer than most. And people are expecting we have to plan for in-migration. And you might think, well, great, so why don't we just develop? every area that's not built. Sure, those are farms. And if California can't grow all the food for the nation anymore, they might actually want to have that grow here. So we might want to have to you know, think about how to balance development with food production, which may be a much bigger part of the national fruit and, and, and grain basket than it has been so far. Growing strain in communities, I'll say a few more words about that. So more flooding, we have traffic disruptions, the sewer overflows, the more freeze and thaw cycles, potholes. <laughs> we all know what that's like. It's gonna cost more to maintain our, our roads and, and other traffic infrastructure. Uh, the extreme heat is not just bad for human health. Our electricity infrastructure or transportation infrastructure actually doesn't do well with extreme heat either. It has to be replaced with that in mind. There are technological ways to fix that. Um, and then, as I said, um, planning for the influx of people. Now, that's a lot that could happen. And I'll say a few words about that, but can we handle it? You know, exposure in my world means, is someone actually going to experience this? Are they at risk? Are they likely to be in contact with those 
hazards that I talked about? And if they are, how bad could it get? Are they particular, uh, uh, you know, sensitive? Are they already having pre-existing conditions that make it harder for them to deal with it? That's one thing. That leads to the potential impacts, and then everything depends on how well we're able to deal with that. If that is high, even if you're exposed or, or you know, sensitive, but if you have good adaptive capacity, then maybe you're not so vulnerable. But if you can't deal with it, that's a problem, right? Then we're getting into high vulnerability situations. So how do we deal with that? Adaptation is all about reducing exposure, reducing sensitivity, and building adaptive capacity to prepare for this and manage those impacts so that we don't have to experience all these negative impacts. That's, the, that's what we want to do. And there is, it fits nicely with every planning cycle you've ever you know, went through. In your business, in your, on your farm, in your town, whatever planning you've ever done, it follows pretty much that cycle. This event today is essentially that first start that preparing the ground. I was proposing this event because I wanted the community to get ready to do this hard work, both on the front end on and on the back end. And all along the way, we need to have all of you engaged in this process. That is absolutely, from 30 years of working on this, I know that this is exactly what is needed. Um, doing it over the heads of the people who live here will not work. You all need to be at the table for it. Now what I want to say is, you're not just you know, left to do this on your own, having to reinvent the wheel. There is a lot of tools out there. At the fed federal level, there's a resilience toolkit that walks you step by step through that cycle that I just showed you. There is a, um, a program that Massachusetts has, a municipal vulnerability program. You can apply for funding to do the planning and then later you can get more funding through that program to do actually the actions to reduce your risk, to build your adaptive capacity. The uh, New England um, the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center has a lot of data and help technical assistance to help with that. Um, there is something at Georgetown University called the Climate, um, Climate Center and it has an adaptation clearinghouse and you can get every guidance, every example, every toolkit that's ever been done anywhere in the country through that uh, clearinghouse and just see whatever helps you do that here. Um, there is guidance now out there on how to develop finance ready projects. Stuff is going to cost something. How do you build better roads, you know, improve your electricity systems, whatever. There's guidance for how to do that. You can get training for the people who need to do this um, at a society called the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. I'm glad to say I was part of founding it. It's a professional society that has all the experts around the country involved in it. And then finally, there is a toolkit, uh, Resilience Metrics, that is essentially soup to nuts help with how to measure whether it's working. So you are not alone. This is something that can be done. I'll close with this and say, other people have done this before, including other small communities and rural communities. I've just worked with a community in Alaska. Um, they included climate adaptation planning in their general um, plan update, in their comprehensive plan, and it is, it's really a, a powerful plan that they've come up with. It's 5,000 people just the size of, of Hadley. Um, adaptation will work if the local community works with other neighboring communities, with the state and federal agencies that have the data, that have the help. Don't do it alone. <laughs> it will not, it, it just makes it slower, and we don't have time. Um, I think action is gonna be required at every level. This is why this afternoon we're gonna have workshops where every one of you can get involved to hear what you can do at the household level, in businesses, on farms, um, and then working with um, the region, um, we're going to have that on the solution panel in a moment, and ultimately with the state and federal uh, level as well. And as I said, we need all of you to be engaged in this. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being in on the ground floor of this. And now we're going to go into the solutions. So thank you very much.